2 Corinthians chapter 6. The title of my message this morning is this, The Value of Holy Living. The Value of Holy Living. There is value in living for the Lord and living a holy life. And um, today we're going to look at that, and I know this message is mainly for those that are saved, those that are born again, but uh, believe me, there's a message for you today if you're not saved and you don't know Christ. There's always a message for you. The value of holy living, 2 Corinthians chapter 6. We're going to begin reading in verse number 14, and we'll go down through chapter 7, verse 1. <clears throat> 2 Corinthians 6, verse 14. The Bible says, Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion hath light with darkness? And what concord hath Christ with Belial? Or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? Verse 16. And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you, and will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty." Now we're going to go to chapter 7, verse 1, which, you know, the chapters and divisions of chapters were put in later. The thought goes on into verse 1, saying this, Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. The word holiness there in chapter 7, verse 1, is what we're talking about. The value of holy living. The word holiness there means sacredness, which means set apart, different. Uh, one preacher said this, the words perfecting holiness in chapter 7, verse number 1, is not merely a ne negative goodness or cleansing, but aggressive and progressive in other words, it's not talking about just being cleaning up your past, but it's living for Christ every day with that thought in mind. And he went on to say, holiness, not a sudden attainment of complete holiness, but a continuous process. In living for the Lord and living a holy life, it's a continuous process. That's why it says there, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Uh, listen, when we get saved, we're not perfect. Amen? We are just sinners saved by grace. And in our Christian life, we are to be perfecting holiness in our lives. That is God's desire for us. That ought to be the desire for ourselves. And in other words, uh, going on to perfection. One of these days, when we get our glorified bodies, we will be perfect. Amen? And sin will be gone, and praise God for that. <clears throat> and so we look at a couple different things, and, and we see that salvation is positional sanctification or positional holiness. In other words, when I get saved, when I get born again, God washes away my sins, past, present, and future. Amen? Aren't you glad of that? Amen? All right. I'm glad of that. Past, present, future. He washes our sins away positionally. We are sanctified before God, but as a person in this world, as a human being, we're still living in a sin-cursed world, and we still have sin-cursed bodies. And we have to continually say no to sin and temptation and make a determination to live for Christ every day. And it's, it's not an easy road. If you've heard that old song before, it's not an easy road that we live in as Christian people. We, there's difficulties, there's temptations, there's trials, there's problems that come into our lives, amen? And so we have to deal with them and we have to 
perfect our holiness and go on for, for God. So there's positional sanctification and progressive sanctification as we grow in the faith and we grow in the Lord and get closer to the Lord. Paul is speaking here to the church of Corinth. Here is a local church. Believers in Christ like you and I. Not much different. They had the same temptations and same problems. They had some difficulties in this area. And so, so the Apostle Paul, when he wrote to them, wrote to them <clears throat> excuse me, he emphasizes these points here about holy living. Let me say this. Holy living does not come naturally. It's, it's not something by accident. It has to be on purpose. Amen. It has to be on purpose that we live for Christ and live a holy life. Some say, well, some, I, I've had people say to me, well, I cannot get saved. I, I can't get saved because I cannot live like that. You know what they're talking about? They're talking about holy living. I'm not going to get saved because I could never live like that. Well, I've got news for you. Neither can I. Amen. We must realize that in our own power, we cannot live like that. We must depend upon the power of God in our lives and the Holy Spirit working in our lives to bring us to that point and to help us live for the Lord. It can only be accomplished with the Holy Spirit living in us and through us. And so we're going to look at these verses of Scripture that the Apostle, Apostle Paul wrote here for us to understand and study. I want to start, first of all, in chapter 7, verse 1. The last verse that we read, chapter 7, and verse 1. And my first point is this, the inspiration for holy living. What motivates us and what inspires us to live a holy life? Well, in chapter 7 here, verse 1, he writes and says, Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved. Then he says, Let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness. In other words, live a holy life. Why? Because of these promises. What is the inspiration for holy living? It is God's promises to us. Aren't you glad we have promises from God? And, and folks, listen, God never breaks His promise. Amen? He never breaks His promise. Now I want you to notice here, because He says in chapter 7 of verse 1, because He says the word therefore, you know where I'm going. We're going to look at what therefore is therefore, because therefore is always therefore a reason. I say that so many times. I'm glad that's not the quote they put up on the hallway out there, therefore. <laughs> okay. But it's an important word in the Bible, isn't it? All right, let's go back. Go back to chapter 6 and verse 16. Here's what he says. What agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God, as God hath said. I didn't say this. Paul didn't say this. God said this. I will dwell in them and walk in them and I will be their God and they shall be my people. Here is a promise of God. He's going to dwell in us and He's going to be our God. The God of the universe. The God that created the world. The almighty, all-powerful God is going to dwell in us. The Bible promises that. And He's going to be our God. What a great promise. Amen. Hey, I'm following the God that can make all things better in a second. Amen. That's who I'm following today. What a promise from God. He goes on to give us another promise in verse 17. He says, Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing. Be ye separated, holy living, and I will receive you. He said he's going to receive us. Now, it's not talking about salvation here because he's writing to people that are already saved. But what he's saying here is that he's going to receive us. That's speaking of that God is uh, uh, 
going to bless us and give us blessing and give us favor when we separate ourselves from the world and we live for Christ, that's when you receive the blessing of God. Are you not getting blessing from God? Maybe you need to separate from the world a little bit more in your Christian life. Maybe you're letting the world in a little bit too much and, and the t- giving in to the temptations of Satan. You've got to say no to those things. And God says, I will receive you. I'll give you favor and blessing whenever you live for me and separate yourself from the things of this world. I'm appalled at Christians today who know more of the, how do I want to say, the popular music and popular singers more than they know the hymns of the church. What a shame. What a shame. They know know rock stars and they know movie stars more than they know preachers of the Word of God or people of the Bible. And yet they call themselves Christians? God help us today. We're in a mess today. Why are we in a mess? Why do we have the choice for the leadership of our country that we have is because that's the kind of shape we're in in this country. Sad. One of the keys to that is God's people living a holy life. I could show you in the Old Testament, I could prove to you from 2 Chronicles 7.14 that God's people need to turn from their wicked ways and pray and live for Christ so God can heal our land. Does not our land need healing? Absolutely it does. We need that today. God promises us. Look at verse number 18. Here's another promise. He says, And I will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. When you live for Christ and you live a holy life, He's going to be a Father to you. And He's going to help you and guide you and lead you. We have the promises of God. Turn over with me to 1 Corinthians. Now, we're going to go back to 1 Corinthians a couple of times here in the message. And then back to 2 Corinthians, All right, So keep things handy. Uh, Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Paul talks about this a little bit. In 1 Corinthians, he mentions about this, and then he repeats it in 2 Corinthians. You know what that tells me? The first time he wrote the letter and told them about this, they didn't get it. And so he had to repeat it again in 2 Corinthians, the second time he wrote to them. But look look what he says in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse number, where are we looking, 16 and 17. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. I got the wrong chapter, all right? Turn with me one page over. Chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. Here's what he says. Know ye not that ye are the temple of the living God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you? Sounds like what he said in 2 Corinthians. Saying it again. If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy. Wow. God, I think God thinks that this is important. If it's important to God, shouldn't it be important to you? Amen. To live a holy life, to live for God every day. If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy. For the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. Now, what does he promise here in these verses to us? He says there in verse 16, Know ye not that ye are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you don't you understand that don't you know that that the spirit of God dwelleth in you one of the promises of God when we live a Christian holy life is his presence will be with us hey why do we come to church this morning why do we come to the house of God why do we sing these songs that we uh, that we chose and we pray over that would glorify him Why do we sing these songs? And why do we have preaching? Why are we here? We are here to worship Him. We are here because we want His presence with us. I come to church. You know, one one of the big reasons I come to be in the presence of God. Now, I know that God is with me all the time. Amen. I'm glad of that. 
And I'm glad when I pray throughout the week and I have devotions and read the Bible, God's presence is there. He's with me all the time. But there's just something special about coming to the house of God. Amen? Amen? I mean, you know, I, I don't know about you, but boy, if I'm sick at home or I'm out of town and I miss it, I miss it. It throws off my whole week. I can't remember what day it is. This is it. This is where we start the week. Amen? Right here. The beginning of the week. And praying that God gives us a good week this week. But He promises His presence among us. I'll tell you what else He promises. His power. His power. Just knowing that God's power is with us gives us confidence in this life. Power gives confidence. Amen? And we need that. We definitely need that. I remember, just a silly illustration here, but I remember some years ago, <clears throat> many years ago, I took my wife to a truck pool. She didn't know what she was getting in for, you know. And I said, bring some things to put in your ears. I think if I remember right, I think it was at the Richfield Coliseum. Is that even still there? I don't even know. You remember that Richfield Coliseum where the Cavs used to play? I think it was there. We got in there and, you know, they had all this dirt on the floor and all of this, you know, and people, man, the place was packed and here comes this truck pull and, and they have different categories, you know, and of course they have the monster trucks out there and, and they're rolling around, you know, and, and I'm looking at my wife, quiet little Sharon, and she's going, yeah, yeah, look at the wow. And I'm like, oh, she kind of likes this. I, you know, I mean that smell of smoke and diesel and she's like loving it. And I remember the small truck category, out of the back came this yellow, I told somebody about this just the other day, this yellow Chevy Love pickup. How many remember the Chevy Love back in the 1900s? You remember that? It's probably an antique, a collector's thing now. But anyways, here comes this Chevy. They were so small. I mean, now I would look at those and how would I get in there? And if I got in, how would I get out, you know? I mean, it's just a little, tiny, little pickup truck that they, Chevy had, and, and uh, they called it the Chevy Love pickup truck. I don't know where they got that, but that's what it was called. And uh, yeah, I was a kid. I wanted one, you know. And it comes out there for a truck pull, and it's got a little puny four-cylinder engine in it. I think to start it, you had to put your foot on the bumper and pull the thing to get it started. I mean, you know. A lawnmower engine, brrr, it comes out. This one didn't have the little four-cylinder lawnmower engine. The guy had taken that out, and he put a great, big, huge V8 engine sticking out of the hood in the front of that Chevy Love pickup. I don't know how the guy looked out the windshield. I mean, the windshield, you know. And he comes pulling out there, the Chevy Love truck. You talk about power. Oh, wait a minute. I forgot to tell you. He also had another V8 engine in the bed of the truck. Two V8 engines, like a V16. You know what I'm saying? I mean, that thing was shooting fire. Out. Wow. I, Sharon was going, yeah, yeah. I mean, here came this little Chevy Love and, and big tires on it and everything like that. I mean... How much of it was Chevy Love? Not very much. But anyways, the power in that little truck. Man, he got it hooked up to that thing. He pulled it out of there, no problem, man. He won the small truck category. He had confidence because he had power. <laughs> Two big V8 engines in that thing. You know, let me tell you something. The devil has power. He does but it's nothing compared to our God. Our God has power, and that in our Christian lives gives us confidence that we can live a holy life. We can. We can perfect holiness in our lives as God's people because we have the power when we have God's power with us. 
We should be motivated when we see this demonstration of His power in our lives. We see God demonstrating His power in our world and miracles taking place. And we read of them through the Scripture and we know of them in our lives and what God does. It should motivate us uh, to to, uh, live for the Lord Jesus Christ. I want you to notice secondly this morning, the agent for holy living. Go back there to 2 Corinthians um, chapter 6 again. 2 Corinthians chapter 6. The agent for holy living. Who's involved in this? Well, in verse number 18 of chapter 6, it says, And will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. God the Father. What is the agent for holy living? It's God the Father. Not only that, go back to verse number 15. Verse 15 says, And what concord hath Christ with Belial? Or what part hath he that believeth in an infidel? We see Christ, that's the Son. The Father and the Son. Back in 1 Corinthians, where we were before, if you want to go back there in chapter, let me see, chapter 6, 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 11. He says, And such were some of you, but ye are washed, but ye are sanctified. The word sanctified means holy living. But ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. Who's the agent of holy living? The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And these three are one. We studied about that on Wednesday night in our prayer time. These three are one. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit are the agents of holy living. But I want you to notice who else. Go back there to 2 Corinthians. chapter. Let's go to chapter 7, verse 1 again. 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 1. I want you to notice something here. The agent of holy living. Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved... Let us, Paul is including himself, but he's also including the Corinthian church. And by the way, he's also including you today, you and me. Here's what he says. Let us cleanse ourselves. Who is another agent there? It's you. It's you. From all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Hey, listen, you've got responsibility here. It's partly your responsibility. God gives you a choice to say yes or to say no to Him. I can't make you do it. God's not going to make you do it. I can't make you get saved today if you're not saved. I can give you the Word of God. The Holy Spirit can convict your heart. But listen, the decision is up to you. You're going to make the decision. As a Christian, as a saved person, am I going to live a holy life or am I going to live a worldly life? It's your choice. It's your choice. Choosing to live for the Lord, you receive His blessing. You know what, you, what else you receive? You receive rewards in heaven someday. By faithfulness, the Bible says there's a crown of faithfulness. There's a reward in heaven. Do you know that some Christians are going to get to heaven and get zero rewards? None. I led a guy one time in Florida. I led him to the Lord on his deathbed. He died two hours after I led him to Christ. I'm so glad he got saved. That shows God's mercy. He is in heaven. He trusts the Lord. Thank God for that. But he lived a wicked life all of his life and never laid up one reward in heaven. Isn't that sad? That's sad. He's going to stand before God. He's, when the rewards are handed out, he's going to get nothing. He didn't know what it was to live in this world a Christian life and receive blessings from God. He has no idea of that. No understanding of that. I'm glad I understand. Amen. I'm glad I understand. You see, we have a responsibility. Go over with me to the book of Romans for just a second. The book of Romans 
chapter 12 and verse number 1. You see, part of the agent of holy living is ourselves. Here's what uh, it says in Romans 12, 1. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Notice, ye present your bodies. It's your responsibility. It's your choice. It's up to you. There are Christians that choose not, not even to follow the Lord in baptism. I believe they're still saved. I, I have no reason to doubt. They trust the Lord. They're saved, but they, they're a disobedient child. They never come to church. You know what they are? They're backslidden, and they need to get right with God. Well, there are a lot of Christians today just need to get right with God. I don't know, maybe that's you here today. Maybe you just need to get things right with God. I encourage you to do that today. And receive the blessings of God and the favor of God. What is the extent of holy living? My third point, the extent of holy living. Now go back here to our text verses here, 2 Corinthians 6. And starting with verse 14, I want you to notice here the extent of holy living. The first thing that we see here is we see these comparisons. Look at these contrasting ideas here in verse after verse. He says, Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers, for what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? Question mark. What's the answer? The answer is none. There is no fellowship. What communion hath light with darkness? What's the answer? None. There is no communion between light and darkness. There's a song I, I heard this week that says, um, the darkness, how did it say that? Um, there's not enough darkness to put out the light. That's a great statement, isn't it? The light is Jesus Christ. And there's not enough darkness to put out his light. Oh, what a great thought. I could preach on that. But what, what communion hath light with darkness? What concord hath Christ with Belial? Or what hath, part hath he that believeth with an infidel? The answer is none. There isn't. Look at these contrasts here. Look at verse 16. What agreement hath the temple of God with idols? None. There is no. These ingredients do not mix together. What he's talking about is the way of the world and the way of Christ. You choose one or the other, folks. You can't mix it. Some people are trying to straddle the fence, you know, be on both sides of the fence. Hey, it doesn't work like that. If you're trying to please both, then you're pleasing the world and the flesh and the devil, and you're not pleasing Jesus Christ. That's just the way it is. They do not mix together. Remember what he says in chapter 7 and verse 1. He says, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. You know, the Christian life is a journey. Really is, isn't it? It's a journey. When you get saved, the Bible calls it being born again. It's being born spiritually. And that's a journey that you start on. What a journey it is, living the Christian life. I'll tell you one thing about it. Living the Christian life gets exciting. Amen? It also gets discouraging. Amen? When the devil jumps on your back and starts to throw problems in your path, yeah, it can get discouraging. But it is exciting. Christians are on this journey. The Bible says there in chapter 7, verse 1, perfecting holiness. We're on a journey to perfectness. That's, we, we ought to have that desire. It ought to be our desire to be Christ-like. And what was Jesus Christ? He was perfect in everything. He never sinned. What an example to us. He could live in this world and never sin. Never ever. He's our example, isn't he? Amen? Well, if we are to be Christ-like, if that is our desire, and it should be our desire, to be like 
Christ. God help me. God help us to not give in to the temptation of the world and to live for Jesus every day. I think Brother Jim said something about that in the very beginning of the service. It's not just on Sunday. It's living for Jesus every day. My last point is this, the intent of holy living. The intent of holy living. I want you to turn in your Bibles over to 1 John chapter 2. 1 John chapter 2. The intent of holy living is to please God. We are His children. If we're saved here today, we are His children. He loves us. And uh, he, he wants us to please Him. And it ought to be our desire to please Him. You know, it's the same in, in any home. I don't know about you, but you know, when my kids were under my roof in my home, I, I wanted my kids to be happy. We had a lot of happy good times. But there were times when there was a little issue, a few little issues going on. Why? Because, hey... I'm not a perfect parent. My wife and I aren't perfect, and my kids certainly weren't perfect. Amen? And so there's issues there, and there's problems there that you have to deal with, and you have to fight it out, and, and you have to say, I, I used to say to my kids, remember this, I'm not fighting against you, I'm fighting for you. We are on the same team here. It's not two different teams. We're on the same team, working, working, trying to live a holy life for God and pleasing God. I, listen, I wanted to please my kids. I didn't want to disappoint them. I wanted to please them all the time. But you know this, if you please your kids all the time, you spoil them. Mm-hmm. Yeah. They get spoiled. Why? They just have human nature like you and me, Right? Sometimes you have to disappoint your children, but you know in the long run it's best for them. And sometimes your kids disappoint you. Amen? I think our kids, you know, when I was a kid, I have to look at it this way. When I was a kid, I wanted to please my mom and dad. I wanted them to be happy with me, especially my dad. You know my dad. Boy, if you made dad happy, it was happy living. My dad, I mean candy bars and pop and all of those things. And my mom would be saying, now, Larry, that's not good for the kids. Now, they need to eat their spinach. <laughs> Please, mom. I'll eat my spinach after a couple of candy bars, all right? <laughs> candy bars and spinach, that doesn't mix too well, does it? You know, but anyhow, yeah, I mean, my mom was that way. But boy, dad was happy, good times. That's, that's what my dad, he likes to have a good... He likes to party. He's a party animal is really what he is. I wanted to please my dad. I wanted dad to be happy with me. Happy. I want God to be happy with me. Amen? It's good times when God is happy. Even in the midst of our world today, and it seems today we see God, God's wrath and judgment. God knows his people. He knows where you are. He knows what you're going through. He knows your situation. And hey, even though trials and trouble come, you can be happy in the Lord. You can be happy in the Lord. I talked to Priscilla a couple times this week. Sorry to use you as an illustration, but anyhow. And uh, we knew that Don didn't have very long to go. And Priscilla said to me, I just want him to be happy. Ever since I've been pastor here for nine years, he's never been able to come through these doors because he couldn't walk, he couldn't get up. And she said, I love him so much, I just want him to be happy. And when he passed from this earth to the land beyond, he's able to walk, to jump and leap and praise the Lord. Amen. I mean, that's, that's the Christian life. It's different than this world. It sure is different that even when somebody passes away that knows the Lord, 
we can rejoice. Amen. We can be happy for them. Hey, you know what? They wouldn't come back here if they had the choice to come back here. They wouldn't come back here. They would say, no, nah, I'm not going there. You come here, right? <laughs> I mean, for sure. Holy living pleases God. Holy living causes you to be more effective in your witness for Christ. When you live a holy life, it causes others in your witness to be more affected by the gospel and the preaching of the gospel. Not only the intent of holy living is to please God, but listen to me, it's to please us too. It's to please us. Not that we're being selfish, but we, when, when we live a holy lives, we are much better for it in the long run. Amen? It's a healthier, better life. To live. You know what the Bible says? The way of the transgressor is hard. You think you got it hard in your Christian life? Let me tell you something. It's a lot worse without Him. It's a lot worse without Him. We have God, no matter what the struggles and problems we go through as God's people, we have Him right there by our side. Amen? What a comfort to know that. What a blessing to know that. This is God's blessing upon us, that we live a good life when we please Him, when we live a holy life. We come to Christ, friends, all of us, we came to Christ the same way. Vile, evil, wicked sinners. That's how we came to Christ. We had nothing to present Him. All that we had was our sins. Even our righteousness was as filthy rags when we came to Christ. But you know what? He welcomed us, He accepted us, and He changed us from vile, rotten sinners into people that are separated and holy unto Him. Bless God for what He does. Amen. And if you're here today without Him, without Jesus Christ, He went to the cross and He died on the cross to pay for your sins. And your sins can be washed away because He bled and died to pay for our sins. Would you accept Him today?